to Belize, more specifically to Caracol. These are the remnants of an ancient Mayan city that was once the most important and powerful city in the entire Mayan empire. Caracol at its height in about 650 AD stretched for about 70 square kilometers, had about 150,000 people, which to put in perspective is about twice as much as Belize city today. And is a reminder of just how fast and how far empires can fall. The Mayan Empire, which is distinct from the Inca Empire, stretches across what's now six modern day countries, uh, from Mexico down to Honduras. While the ruins are a stone gray now, at their height they were covered by a, a white cream colored coating. And imagine how they would have looked reflecting in the sun against the greenery of the jungle. Would have been really impressive. Still is. I should never have skipped leg day. I should have done more pistol squats. Now, no one is entirely sure how the Mayan empire collapsed, but a series of weather-related events, internecine feuds, civil wars, and it seems a change in the government system from autocratic ruling to collective ruling actually caused the collapse. And it got its independence in the 1980s. This is the assembly building and it is a democracy. I do have to say it isn't one of the most beautiful assembly buildings in the world, but Belize also has palm trees, diving and reefs. Like this dive site, the Blue Hole. So the Blue Hole is an old cave which was dry during the Ice Age. And as the Ice Age ended, it was filled. So you've now got a whole lot of stalactites and stalagmites underwater. It's pretty cool, actually. The Blue Hole in this little island, Half Moon Cay, is part of a World Heritage Protected Area as it's the fourth largest reef system in the world and one of the few island systems that still has a literal forest. As part of the literal forest, you get these gumbo limbos trees that the Belizeans nickname as the tourist trees because they get this white peeling bark that resembles tourist skin, red and peeling. I know that feeling. So it's not just here in Belize, it's also in Honduras. The Honduras to Belize Reef, the Mesoamerican Reef, is the fourth largest in the world. Some try to tell you it's the second, but it's not. Number one's Great Barrier Reef, then you've got the Red Sea, then you've got the Vanuatu Reef, and then this one. But Central America is not just reef, you've also got other things like sloths are one of those things in Central America I came to see. They've evolved to move incredibly slowly. I don't know how that happened. They eat about nine grams of food a day. They go to the toilet once a week and they live for about 30 years. Here in Roatan, we're 65 kilometers off the north coast of Honduras. And while Roatan is part of Honduras, it is largely English speaking. Since Honduras got its independence in 1821, it's been a republic that entire period, although it has, with other Caribbean countries, tried to form unions that haven't worked. Roatan was largely a British colony for most of its time, not a Spanish one, and the Spanish-speaking people on Honduras call the English-speaking islanders here Caracons as a bit of an insult. But because it's an English-speaking part of a Spanish-speaking country, this is a good place to be before I start my Spanish lessons in in Antigua, Guatemala, in this wonderful school with great rooms, fantastic gardens overlooked by three volcanoes. If this was my secondary school, maybe I would have got better grades. If you look closely, you can see that one of the volcanoes has had a little bit of a puff this morning. It's pretty active. 
Antigua was founded in the 1500s and acted as the Spanish colonial capital in Central America. And it was the capital until 1773, a massive earthquake destroyed most of Antigua and was rebuilt, but the capital was moved in 1776 to Guatemala City. In 1979, Antigua was declared a World Heritage Site. Because of its place in history, a lot of the buildings still remain with beautiful pastel colored colonial architecture in quaint little cobblestone streets. It's also known for its chocolate. And chocolate comes from a fruit. Chocolate nuts come from the seeds. The seeds are roasted and that creates the cocoa powder. Cocoa powder is naturally a little bit bitter, a lot of antioxidants are really good for you until you mix it with a whole bunch of sugar and turn it into the chocolate that you know from Cadbury's and that's not so good for you. Here in the Central Park in Antigua is this little plaque that commemorates another thing that Guatemala is known for, which is avocados. So every Australian kid struggling to get a mortgage because they've got an avocado on toast addiction, this is where it started. So on that note from the Central Park of Antigua and después diez días apprendre espanol, viaje a El Salvador. Morning and welcome to El Salvador, a country of tropical trees, beautiful wave breaks and black sanded beaches. Now why black sanded beaches? Because the country's volcanic. And why great surf? Because the next country that way, west, is Philippines. You've got the entire Pacific Ocean going that way, meaning that El Salvador is a haven for surfers. But with a long coastline and only 6.5 million people, and with a reputation that doesn't suck in tourists, there's plenty of sand space for anyone who wants to come. It's also a country known for its political instability, its coups, civil wars, and its coffee. And these are coffee plants, and this is a coffee bean. When it's ripe, it goes red, and you get the seed from the middle of it, which is the coffee bean that we're used to seeing, but it's white. And it's only after you roast it that it becomes the deep dark brown or the black that we're used to. Steak with coffee bean sauce? As much as I like steak and coffee, no. So I'm hiking up a volcano in El Salvador and the entrance fee is three dollars but the guy took one look at my face and my beard with all its white hair and said but it's free if you're over 60. <sighs> so 2,300 meters up seeing steam coming off this strangely colored lake and the smell of sulfur tells you yep this is a live volcano 2,300 meters more or less the summit of Santa Ana volcano El Salvador. And the next stop is Costa Rica. And I've managed to stumble into Costa Rica on its Independence Day. Costa Rica got its independence in 1821, as did a lot of other Central American countries. As France invaded Spain and Spain lost its focus on its Central American colonies, one after the other in a domino effect from Mexico all the way down, they all got their independence on or around September 1821. The reason I'm in Costa Rica on Independence Day is because I'm supposed to be a Nicaragua, but they didn't let me in. But I have a plan B to get there. And this is Costa Rica, and that's Nicaragua. I'm gonna find a way of getting there without the beard. This lovely stretch of beach all on my own, the north coast of Costa Rica. So far north that that tree is the border with Nicaragua. So this is the border between Costa Rica and Nicaragua. Uh, and this is the Nicaragua side. Now I'm on the Nicaragua side. Uh, <laughs> Let's talk Nicaragua for a second. So I tried today for the second or third time to legally get into Nicaragua and told that I'm not allowed Apparently they don't like human rights lawyers. That's how scared their dictatorial regime is. And to put it in perspective, I was allowed into Russia, I was allowed into North Korea, I was allowed into Yemen, I was allowed into Syria, but I'm not allowed into Nicaragua. There is the status of Nicaragua. 
But because I have this silly objective of visiting every single country in the world, I've got to get in there, don't I? So yes, I went in once yesterday, illegally, through the border near the beach. But today I also went down a people smuggling track into Nicaragua. I know it's not smart, but it was done. So this is the border between Nicaragua and Costa Rica in a very remote place. So let's go into Nicaragua. Uh, here on the map, this is where I am. Away from the roads, the border between Nicaragua and Costa Rica is porous as hell. And judging by the number of footprints along this remote muddy track, I suspect this is where a number of people smuggling operations take place. Oh, that was hot. Back into Costa Rica. That's the last habitation before the border. And this is my trusty steed. And I'm really starting to like Suzuki Jimmy's because they've taken me on a few adventures now, including this one. So with all the excitement of Costa Rica to Nicaragua to Costa Rica to Nicaragua to back to Costa Rica, there's only one country in Central America left, that is. On the 3rd of November 1903, Panama declared its independence from Colombia here in Independence Square. The cathedral over the shoulder was built over more than 100 years from 1688 to 1796. And there are a lot of things I can tell you about Panama, but really there's only one. And it's not the unusual juxtaposition between the new and the old parts of Panama City that's the most striking thing. Although the old town is stunningly beautiful and constantly being renovated, the little cobblestone streets and the pastel colored buildings are beautiful. It is, of course, one of humankind's most amazing engineering feats. I'm speaking about, of course, the Panama Canal. Now, French engineer Ferdinand Lesseps, when he finished building the Suez Canal decided to take a crack at Panama and initially he wanted to build a sea level canal. The problem with the sea level canal is the Pacific Ocean is about 20 centimeters higher than the Atlantic Ocean is and if you built a sea level canal it would create some horrible currents and potentially disrupt species on both sides of the canal. The second problem is you would need to have carved all the way through a whole bunch of mountains. Now, building the sea level canal sent the French bankrupt. When the Americans took it over, their alternative was to lift the canal up to the level of the Gatun Lake, which is about 26 metres above sea level. So you have a series of locks on either side of the canal that lifts ships up to the artificial Gatun Lake, allows them to sail approximately 50 miles through there before hitting the locks on either side to go up or down again. The Panama Canal is a feat of human engineering and it's carved through some magnificent jungle which still has some really cool wildlife in it and to be hooning along in a little boat through a lake in a jungle to then have a huge ship with containers coming past you is a sight to behold. A feat of engineering indeed. The Panama Canal, the thing that you come to Panama to see.